Hey there. Uh, so this is Andrew Johnston, and I'm uh, really happy to be here and be doing this for you today. Uh, so I was thinking uh, the first place that I really want to start, especially as we're just getting started, uh, and as we start to kind of learn how to make the most use of this, and really I want to just get into the you know test prep questions, really get into the meat of the review of the EMT material, and to really just maximize the coverage of it, and to give you just all the little tips and tricks and everything that, uh, that have come up over the years for it. So, so much of this stuff really gets down to test taking strategies. I'm really confident that if you can make it through an EMT program and be successful, uh, that you should be able to pass national registry on, on your first try. That doesn't happen for everybody. It doesn't even happen for every one of my students uh, at my school, but the possibility is there, the potential is there, the opportunity is there for you to do it. So I wanted to start this first session here and really just kind of review some of the stuff about National Registry that really, uh, you know, it's public knowledge, it's stuff that's posted on their website, but without some kind of contextual explaining behind it, then it's not really something that a lot of people understand really about National Registry. And there's a ton of rumors out there and everything, and it's crazy. Um, so I've been teaching full time since 2012. I started an EMT program. Uh, and then by the end of 2012, I was doing the, the paramedic program as well and was program director over both programs. Uh, so I've been full time doing this stuff for eight years now and decided to really get into kind of this tutoring. I call it coaching just because some people have a uh, you know, negative connotation with, with getting tutoring, you know, with getting help. So I'm calling it coaching. Right? We'll feel better on that. Call it coaching. Uh, but really, I've been involved with EMS education, at least in some capacity, since 2010. So 2010 is when I graduated and got my paramedic certification. And the school that I got it at uh, immediately needed some help with like National Registry skills proctoring. And so I got in right away, just starting doing some skills proctoring. And then after a certain period of time, I got my CPR instructor certification. Then they let me guest lecture a little bit, and then it just kind of kept building. Uh, and really, I found a passion for it with teaching and with helping students, and really seeing, you know, even over the course of a comparatively short EMT program, uh, to see the development that's possible in students, and absolutely just fell in love with it. Um, I didn't come from a family with a background in healthcare or EMS or anything at all, by any stretch of it. I really, uh, it was something that was of an interest to me, and so I got involved in it, right? and I started there. Uh, now, weirdly, I have a lot of teachers in my family, so now it's kind of funny that I'm on the education side, but that was never the goal. Right? I started paramedic school with the idea of I want to go the fire department route, and the more I got into paramedic, the more I fell in love with the medical side of things and medicine, and so I had the idea that I wanted to go to medical school. And so after I started working uh, as a paramedic uh, for a private ambulance company, then I started going back to school. I already had my undergraduate degree in psychology. And then I went back to get, you know, more biology, more chemistry, all those classes that I needed to. And that at the same time is when I got more and more involved on the education side. And like I said, I just I fell in love with it. I uh, got the best of both worlds, which was a passion for medicine and a passion for teaching. Uh, so that just kind of kept me going. So I've been, like I said, I've been doing this for a little while now, um, have guided our, our program through national accreditation as well. And so really have just, you know, doubled down my life's, you know, focus of developing uh, EMS programs and really just maximizing how programs can meet the needs of students, right? Um, where the, the goals of the program is to not make it easy on the instructor side, the goal of the program is you learn, the material right and so recently I've been you know kind of itching to help even more people um, in terms of volume here in Arizona where I'm at we I run pretty much one of the largest EMS schools in the state um, we're actually knocking on the door to probably be the largest this year by the end of it um, for training uh, most the most EMT students and almost the most paramedic students out of any school in the state so we've got a good system you know it works its way a lot uh, but so much of it I've seen is I've, I've talked to students that have come from other programs that have varying levels of, of success or failure with those programs. And I really found that it just gets down to, uh, 
you know, respecting the student and focusing on what learning works for the student and catering it a little bit, right? There's no one size fits all for school, right? Every student doesn't learn the same way. So the programs have to be structured to, to accommodate everybody. And so I got into to this now thinking about doing, you know, the coaching and the tutoring to really, like I said, figure out how I can help more students, right? Um, you know, more students in Arizona, more students around the country, you know, around the, the world, right? For potentially taking paramedic or EMT in other countries. Uh, and the reality is, again, so much of it is just the foundational same. It's just little tips and little strategies go a long way towards uh, success on national registry, you know, which is everybody's kind of big initial focus. Right? You got past the program, right? Which depending on the program is going to kind of dictate how uh, easy or difficult that is. Uh, but then passing national registry, actually getting certified is everybody's pretty much step number one of doing. And there's just a lot of little tips and tricks and stuff like that that help for national registry. Um, so I actually got the opportunity two years ago to go to national registry in Columbus, Ohio, and to serve on an item writing committee where it was actually test questions that I wrote uh, me and a group of about 10 other program directors and medical directors from schools around the country all got in the same room and we just beat up multiple choice questions that then got submitted into the test bank for national registry to be piloted to see if they become potential questions that actually get uh, utilized into the system. Um, so it's very interesting. A lot of people are like, oh, national registry is trying to trick you, right? Or national registry is trying to screw you over or something. The National Registry didn't write the questions, right? I did. Your program directors did. Your medical directors did, right? So it's not they. It's not National Registry. Right? They're just delivering the exam, right? And running the statistics behind it, which is fascinating. Um, it's kind of like medicine, right? Everything we do in medicine is evidence-based, right? There's research behind it. There's statistics behind it. It's the same thing for National Registry, right? It's all of the statistics behind what makes a good exam and the statistics behind confidence level that your knowledge is, is sufficiently up there. Um, so it's been a very interesting process. I wanted to kind of start there with a little bit of the background of what goes in the National Registry before we jump into you know, kind of a review of body systems or review of topics or anything like that. So uh, getting in here, a big part for EMT is understanding just what are we walking into? Right? When, you, when we go take that computer test, uh, and maybe you've taken it and, and failed, maybe you haven't taken it yet, or you took it, but it was a long time ago, and you're testing again to get your National Registry certification back. Uh, so there's a variety of different you know, ways and places that you could be right now in this process. But knowing just what you're walking into when you get to the testing center is huge. Right? So it's published on National Registry's website. Uh, that the computer test uh, for EMT, right, this is specific for EMT, is 70 to 120 questions, right? Mandated, right? Not a person in the world got less than 70 questions or more than 120 questions, right? And people say, oh, I got cut off at 60. No, they didn't. Right? 60 might have been the last number that they saw on the screen when they took the test, but everybody at least gets 70, right? Uh, now it's 60 to 110 live questions, and 10 what they call pilot questions. So when I went to, to registry, like I said, and we did item writing, and I submitted a whole bunch of questions, um, if you know we beat up and we tweaked those questions enough and decided like, yep, that's a valid question, let's put it into the test bank, let's pilot it, right? Where these questions are questions that they're evaluating to see how people answer it, to see if it's a good question or a bad question. Uh, if it needs tweaked or if it's acceptable as it is, or if it's really bad, just toss it out entirely. So everybody gets 10 pilot questions, which if you get right, it doesn't count for you on the test. But if you get it wrong, it also doesn't count against you, right? So it's just 10 questions, and you don't know which 10 questions it is. It's not the first 10 questions for everybody, right? It's just 10 questions that are sprinkled in throughout it. So it's 10 questions that uh, don't count for you, don't count against you. They're just trying to build some data behind it. Right. Everything in this whole process is data driven. Right. Um, so 60 to 110 questions are what they actually evaluate you against. Um, but it's 70 to 120 total because you get the 10 pilot questions. Now, the science behind uh, 
exam statistics and the, the research behind it. For these adaptive tests where they have, you know, varying degrees of difficulty on questions and the varying different categories uh, and all of it. Uh, once you reach 60 questions, the computer, the algorithm that's evaluating it, the computer is very good at predicting whether you know enough that it'll result in a pass or whether you don't know enough and it results in a failure. Once you reach 60, it's pretty well dialed in for how you're going to do. Uh, the reason it keeps asking you more questions, because some people get cut off there at the 70 with their pilot questions. Other people will go the full 120 and they can still pass at that number. So the reason why the computer keeps asking more questions is it's trying to build a statistical significance that's really just dialing in to making sure that you know enough, right? They're all evaluating, like you said, it's, it's designed to build statistical confidence and the ability to provide safe and effective emergency entry level emergency medical care, right? So that's what it's evaluating. So it's just trying to build a mathematical confidence that you know enough, right? Which I think is good. Everybody can kind of universally accept that that's a good idea, right? So it's designed to, again, just build that confidence level up. Uh, you have two hours to take it, right? Um, there's no bottom limit of time, so you could fly through a bunch of questions, be done in 30 minutes. Um, but you have two hours to take it, so maximum 120 questions, maximum 120 minutes, you're looking at about a minute per question. Um, so once it reaches that 60, again, it knows pretty well likely how you're gonna do. It just keeps asking you more and more questions just to build that confidence level. Um, so some of the reasons why you could be getting more questions is if you answer a hard question right, but you're answering easy questions wrong, right, for how they have uh, questions kind of rated as varying degrees of difficulty level. If you're getting the really hard questions correct, but you're getting the really easy rated questions wrong, so basically it's confusing the system, right? And the system like, does this person know enough or do they not, right? I have no idea, right? You're, you're missing the easy ones, but then you're getting the hard ones right. And so it's just confusing the system. So a system just keeps asking you more questions, right? All the way up to potentially 120. As again, it's trying to just build that statistics of, yep, okay, for sure they know enough and then it'll cut you off, right? So once it meets, meets that kind of threshold statistics level, then the computer will say, yep, you're good. And it'll shut you off there, whatever random number that question is, right? Or if it reaches that statistical confidence that you don't know enough, as soon as it's, it reaches that threshold of confidence, it'll shut you off at whatever random question and say, yep, we're pretty confident you don't know enough, right? So it's a very interesting process. They just keep asking questions just to build statistics, right? Just to build confidence, statistical confidence that you know enough or don't know enough. Right? Uh, one of the biggest rumors, and I'd heard it for years, I believed it uh, until I went there, was that some people will get the full 120 questions no matter what. Right? That's a big time rumor out there. People around the country have this, this rumor that a few people just randomly get selected to get the full 120 question, regardless of their performance on the test. Uh, and even the people at National Registry have said, we've heard that too. We have no idea where that uh, rumor came from. And their whole justification against why they would do that in the first place is just by arbitrarily making somebody take more questions means that more people just know more questions when they didn't need to. And so protecting the integrity of the exam is only showing people enough questions for the computer algorithm to figure out confidence level. Right? So by just arbitrarily saying, hey, John, you're gonna get more uh, questions today just because you're unlucky number five today, uh, all that does is make John see more questions and then John can potentially go back to his school and say, hey, here's the questions I got. I got this question and this question, this question, this question. Right? So it just compromises the integrity of the exam more than anything. And it doesn't serve any statistical basis of help for the, the science behind proper examination strategies. So it's a very interesting thing, but that's a big time rumor. And I'm very curious if you guys have heard that one as well. Um, I definitely have with, uh, again, just some people randomly get 120 questions. No, they don't. <laughs> and if you got 120 questions, because the computer needed the full 120 questions to see if you knew enough, 
right? So that's that one, right? The other big one here is really just the different categories. And this was arguably the most fascinating component of being there and hearing the explanation of, of how this works from uh, National Registry directly. Uh, so every single person will get questions uh, categorized across these five uh, topics. So airway, respiration, ventilation, cardiology and resuscitation, trauma, medical obstetrics, gynecology, and EMS operations. So everybody gets evaluated across all five of those categories. And that's where you see if, you, if you've taken the test and you failed, you know you can log in and you can see above passing, near passing, below passing for airway above passing, near passing, below passing for cardiology, right? For each of the categories, they rate you there. Uh, and of those categories, you can see there's an 85-15% split. So 85% of your airway questions will be adult. 15% of those airway questions will be pediatrics for everybody, right? Same thing with cardiology, trauma, med ob uh, EMS operations, right? Operation-based questions don't really have age differences, so they don't split those uh, adult versus pediatrics. Um, and it's very interesting, just in the, the test software that we were using when we were there, there's just a little button that they click that says, this is an adult question. This is a button that they click that says it's a pediatric question, right? So it just goes into the system categorized based off of what topic it is. Is it adult or is it pediatric? And then when you go and take the test, it pulls the questions right, to make sure that you're getting questions across each category, you're getting the 85% adult and 15% pediatric questions, uh, and then the percentage of your overall exam is where there's a little bit of variation, a little bit of wiggle room, right? So on airway, respiration, ventilation, 18 to 22% of your exam uh, is composed of those questions, 20 to 24, cardiology, trauma, 14 to 18, med ob 27 to 31, EMS operations 10 to 14. So everybody's exam falls into that, right? If there's 70 to 120 questions, falls into these five categories, the 85, 15% split for adult pediatrics, and these percentages of the exam, everybody. Now, one person may get 18% airway respiration ventilation, another person may get 22%. That's their slight variability there but everybody's, all five categories can fall into these uh, percentage ranges. Uh, now the interesting part, and really one of the parts that, that I can't stress the importance of enough to you guys, is to take every single question that you get on your national registry as a isolated question. Don't base any thought process on looking at this question based off of prior questions that you've seen or what number question you're at, or what that last question said, right? Don't base any sort of history on that as some sort of subtle meaning of why they might be giving you this question, right? That's where I think half the people lose the national registry game and fail the test because they get twisted up in their mind on, on all the meanings of these like, yeah, well, if I, if I got this question, it's similar to that last one. That must mean I got that last one wrong, so let me answer this one differently. The more you get twisted up in that game, the more you're likely to fail. I just promise you that, right? Treat each question as its own question, irrespective of any prior question whatsoever, right? Um, if you uh, answer a question and you click next, and that next question is an airway question, it just means that for these percentages of exams, based on the total number of questions you've asked, you're furthest away from meeting the 18 to 22% needed for airway compared to the other categories. Right? So the category of the next question is just where are you furthest away from reaching these windows, right? Reaching these percentages that you need. Right? If you've answered 18% airway, 20% cardiology, 14% trauma, 10% EMS operations, and only 14% medical obstetrics gynecology, like that's the one that you're furthest away from the range, and I guarantee you that next question you get will be categorized as a medical obstetrics gynecology question, right? That's how it dictates what that next question is, is it pulls from what category are you furthest away from, right? It has no meaning based off of 
you answered that last question right or wrong, so that must say that that means why I'm getting this question next. Like, nope, it's just that's the category that you're furthest away from, right? There's no hidden meaning to it. Um, that's where, like I said, I, I think people get lost in that stuff more than anything else. Now, this part uh, was on either my second to last day or the last day I was at National Registry. Uh, we were there for like three days, just hours upon hours of beating up test questions. And so this is not a question that, that we had at National Registry. I don't play that game of trying to just give you guys answers. That's not the purpose of this. The purpose of it is to highlight critical thinking and to make sure you can work yourself through the National Registry test with confidence to be successful. Right? Uh, I'll give you tips and tricks, but I'm not going to, you know, you know, do unethical stuff to get you there, right? So in this question, uh, your patient experienced blunt trauma to the chest and is coughing up blood. You should A, insert an oropharyngeal airway adjunct, B, suction for no longer than 15 seconds, C, implement spinal motion restrictions, D, assist ventilations with a bag, bag valve mask device. My question to you guys is what topic is this? Okay. Is it an airway respiration ventilation question? Is it a trauma question? Cardiology resuscitation? Med OB guide? Probably not. EMS operations? Probably not. Right? I bet, just based off my experience, probably about half of you guys are going to say this is a trauma question, right? This blunt trauma to the chest, this is a trauma question, right? And half of you, probably going to say, but it's asking you, like, it's asking you about an airway intervention, right? They're coughing up blood. We need to suction, right? I, I think this is an airway respiration ventilation question. And the other half of the people are like, no, that's silly. Blunt trauma to the chest. It's in the question, trauma, right? And somebody else is like, no, it's just coughing up blood. It's airway, right? And so when we were at National Registry, when we actually were going question by question by question through that, we had little quick clickers. Right? And based on the clicker, uh, we would put the question up and we would look at it and we'd say, that's a cardiology resuscitation question. I would press the button for cardiology resuscitation. Uh, and everybody in the room, the other program directors, the other medical directors, uh, they would sit there as well and they would say, uh, airway respiration. Somebody else would be like, this is a medical question, right? And then we would see, like, oh, half of our group chose trauma. A third of our group chose uh, OB. Right? And 20% of you chose airway. And then we would just group think, have a discussion amongst ourselves, and see if we could land on a general consensus of this question being, in this case, a trauma question versus an airway question. And then whichever one had the most votes at the end of the day is how it got categorized, right? It blew my mind, right? Because I've always, I had told students for the longest time, you're pretty much guaranteed that two out of those five categories will get emphasized more than others. Well, it's not true. All categories will be uh, in the percentages of these. Now you could have some on the high end and some on the low end. I'll give you that. There is some variation in there. But it's fascinating to think that for a question like this, it could be a trauma question. It could be an airway question. Okay? So some people, they'll come out and they'll be like, man, I had, a tr I had a ton of trauma questions. Well, I guarantee you some of those trauma questions were actually categorized as airway. And some of the trauma questions were categorized as cardiology and resuscitation. And some of the trauma questions were categorized as trauma, right? Um, so it was very, very interesting to just understand that of all the questions that are out there, it could look like a cardiac arrest question, and your mind says this is probably cardiology resuscitation, but then that group of program directors and medical directors that day said, we're going to call it an airway question, because what it's actually asking about is asking about something about the airway. So there's no right or wrong answer for, for us that were there for rating and categorizing these. It's just whatever our group thought is the category that it got uh, assigned. So it's very, very interesting. Um, the only reason why I go through all of this stuff is to really just get yourself out of your head of the mind games of the test. Right? The test is not trying to trick you. They're not trying to stump you. Right? It's just that's how it actually gets built. 
okay, is questions that we, program directors, instructors, medical directors, we write the questions and then we go to National Registry and we beat up the questions into the format that they use. They do, there's a format to them. And then at the end of it, then we all vote and say, the majority of us voted that that's a cardiology question. So it goes cardiology. Even if some of us disagree, right? Whatever got the most votes at the end of it is the one that got the most votes. So that's the category that it got assigned to. So what do we do about it? What can you guys do about this? Slow down, right? I know that's easy for me to say. I remember, right? I remember getting to the Pearson View Testing Center about an hour before my paramedic test. It's like first thing in the morning. Uh, and I was sitting in the car, like flipping through my paramedic textbook, like I was gonna learn anything in that moment, right? Just anxiety through the roof, right? Out of control. And when it was finally close enough for me to go take the test, I'm like, all right, let's do this. I turn the car off, I get out of the car, and I immediately just threw up on the ground, right in the parking lot, right outside the testing center, right? It was, it was embarrassing to say the least. I was looking around, I was like, oh my God, anybody see me? And I walked in and I took my paramedic test. Right? And I walked down thinking, man, I think I failed that test. I do not feel good about it. The worst part is I took it on a Friday, so I didn't find out till Monday. So all weekend long, I was just twisted up in my head. My stomach was at knots, just having no idea if I passed or failed. And then like Monday at 6 a.m. Arizona time, because it was National Registry in Ohio on East Coast time, like 6 a.m. on National Registry, being paramedic, you know, popped through. It was a fantastic feeling. I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful to finally get those results. Um, but so I know it's easy for me to say. I know it's easy for me to say, slow down, focus, right? And in the context of that testing center environment and the stress and the anxiety and the money that's on the line to take these tests, I know it's easy for me to say, but I can't emphasize it enough. Do some deep breathing, right? Take some nice, slow, deep breaths in, hold it for a little bit, breathe out, right? Slow down, right? You know you're, you're, you're on the clock, which doesn't help with the anxiety sometimes. And you know, you just see question by question going by and you have no idea when it's going to cut you off. Right? Just slow down. Right? There'll be plenty of questions that you'll read, know the answer like that, and you just move right on. Right? But there's plenty of other questions that you'll read and you'll read and you'll read and you need a little bit extra time to do. So ultimately, you know, the maximum amount of time you have is two hours, 120 minutes. And the maximum amount of time you have is 120 questions, right? Which means you just average all those out and you have a minute for each question, right? And if we all just sat here and just slowly counted to 60 seconds, it's actually a lot of time, right? It's a lot of time, you really do. Um, where you get the pickup and the benefit is the questions that you read and you're like, boom, I got this. I know what this is asking. Here's my answer, boom, next question. And the whole thing took eight seconds, right? That's how you start building up a little bit of a cushion. So when you get to the longer questions, the more elaborate questions, you really can focus and read a little bit extra and to slow down even more to take a look at what is that question actually asking and what does it mean? How do I answer this? Which one's the correct answer? Why are these other answers wrong, right? It's one of the best ways to look at this is how do we break down the questions? Um, I already kind of talked about it, but focus only on the question in front of you, right? Ignore prior history, right? None of the prior questions mean anything for why you're getting this question now. You're getting this question now in this category, like I said, just because that's the category that you're furthest away from meeting that percentage minimum. Right? Good. Uh, it's not trying to trick you, right? Again, it's your instructors, your program directors, your medical directors writing the questions. Your program director and medical director hopefully are not trying to trick you, right? They want you to be successful, right? All the instructors, all the program directors, they're all you know competing on national registry pass rates against each other, right? If they say they're not, they're probably lying. <laughs> I don't know for sure. Don't quote me on that. Don't say, hey, Andrew said, 
right? But everybody's eyeballing their national registry pass rates, trying to just make sure that we're, you know, doing right by you guys, doing right by our students. Right? If nobody can pass national registry, then that's a failure of the program, in my opinion. Right? It really is. Right? Whether it's a failure of just motivating students to study, or a failure of actually teaching material or a failure of delivering that material in a way that you will actually learn and understand, right? But there's a breakdown somewhere in there. But at least for me, I, I'll, I'll speak to this for myself, I guess. At least for me, I'm not trying to trick my students, right? I want them to be successful, right? I want them to go into National Registry confident because we built up their competence of the material over the course of a uh, EMT program, the repair medic program. Right? So whether your EMT program is, you know, insane three week, you know, nuts, hyper accelerated program, or it's a 15 week long semester program or longer, who knows, right? And when I first started at my school, uh, our EMT program was nine weeks. I slowed it down to about 12 weeks. Right? So still faster than a standard semester schedule but not crazy fast. Right? I get the appeal of, of a faster program, but faster is not always better. So I slowed it down to 12 weeks. And what I saw was student retention went up, student graduation rates went up, national registry pass rates went up. So what it proved to me was more students were being successful. And that's a win in my book, seven days a week, right? More students are being successful. So hopefully your program director, your medical director, your instructors are not trying to trick you, right? Hopefully that's the case uh, because we're the ones writing the test questions, right? It's not National Registry. They probably wrote some, but it's not National Registry. It's me. It's your medical director. It's your program director. Right? I'm going to this one here for a second. Uh, but really, um, sorry, lost you guys there. Um, but really, that's it. I mean, that's kind of national registry um, in terms of some of the, the math behind it, some of the statistics behind it. Um, it's such a uh, helpful thing to understand what you're walking into and, and why it's like that and to not get uh, all twisted up in your head on what these things mean. Right? It doesn't mean anything. It's just trying to evaluate your confidence and your competence. Cool. Awesome. So that's my little bit of a soapbox for the statistics behind National Registry. Uh, we'll have plenty of time. It'll come up over and over again. I'll keep highlighting some of that type of stuff to make sure that you understand it and that you know what it uh, means and that you know what uh, to do about it. Now, put all that math stuff aside, put all that statistic behind you, and let's get into the, the review. All right. So some of the, the comments that you guys had, had messaged about were looking for a review of organ functions and what the different organs do, right? Now, anatomy and physiology is such a big component of critical thinking and understanding what's going on with your patient. And another one was specifically about some cardiology and respiratory assessments. Right? So how do we, uh, my takeaway from that question was how do we differentiate between uh, the different differential diagnosis, right? We don't diagnose in the field, but we have a field impression, a working impression, a differential diagnosis, basically what we think is going on with the patient, right? So based off of all this information, what do I think is going on with my patient? And then based off of that is gonna guide any treatment that I wanna do for them, right? So it's such foundational stuff. Uh, I, I really feel so much of the questions that you will see is here's a bunch of information, what's going on with your patient, right? So I think my patient's having an MI, or I think they're having a tension pneumothorax, or I think uh, I have a ruptured appendix, right? So here's what I think is going on with my patient, right? Or here's a bunch of information, what are you gonna do about it? How are you gonna treat this patient, right? And that's really the other big one. Uh, from what I've really seen and, and heard and, and what I kind of teach to is at the end of the day, you gotta identify what's going on with your patient to the best of our ability, right? And we gotta know how to treat them, right? So, so much of this review session and everything, um, some of the most beneficial stuff I can, can recommend to you guys is focusing on that differential diagnosis and your treatments, right? And that really on the differential diagnosis side, 
gets into pattern recognition, right? And you just recognize these little pattern of signs and symptoms, and that kind of raises a red flag in your head that says, hey, those are my signs and symptoms for tension pneumothorax. And those are my signs and symptoms for cardiac tamponade. And those are my signs and symptoms for uh, ruptured appendix, right? So it's pattern recognition, so that's what we're gonna get into a lot. Uh, on the organ system side uh, is another very big piece of national registry or of uh, broadly understanding uh, medicine and stuff that you'll see questions on too, I'm sure, uh, of really getting into what are the main functions of the liver, the main functions of the upper airway, the main functions of the large intestine, right? all the different stuff. So I'm just going to kind of run through uh, a little bit of some of the organ functions. Uh, first one that I wanted to jump into, and we're about 45 minutes into our hour or so. I wanted to jump into uh, the cardiac system, right? So the cardiovascular system, specifically getting into the heart. Uh, so much of it is uh, understanding uh, what I say, what I teach my students, is you got to be able to map a red blood cell through all the different structures of the cardiovascular system, of the circulatory system. So if you can do that, then if something's going wrong, you can work yourself backwards, right? So I'm gonna get into it, I'm gonna share uh, one of the software programs that I have uh, on my computer. Let me find it here. There we go. All right, so it's the complete anatomy app, right, is what we're seeing here. It's the complete anatomy app. Um, you can get it on your phone. Uh, I think they have a, a paid, uh, I think they have a free version, actually, or at least a free trial. Um, and then they have a lot of different tiers of paid versions. Uh, I've paid for the educator level, so it just has more options and stuff in it, I, I guess. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but it's a very good one because you can go through all the different body systems, go through the different layers in the body, and really start to kind of uh, differentiate with exactly what's going on. So in this one, uh, is showing the heart here, right? And it's showing the different structures and going through this app and actually hide different structures. So I just hid the wall of the right ventricle and then you can manipulate it and move it around and zoom in on it, actually get an idea for what's going on. Uh, so that's a huge uh, benefit to give you a visual of this, um, but I wanna just go over to uh, a drawing tablet here for a second uh, to do this uh, instead. Mm. All right, so on uh, in drawing, if we took a look at the heart, right, that's what we had, and we could kind of split it across our four ventricles, right? So we have the right atrium and the right ventricle, the left atrium and the left ventricle, right? It's important to understand just which way is blood moving, what's responsible for what. Uh, so the right atrium, right, just going back through a review of it, the right atrium gets the blood from the vena cava, right? The superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava, right? So those two big veins, those two big blood vessels meet together and just dump blood right into the right atrium. Right? So again, just understanding that directional movement of blood. Right? Blood comes back from the body, right? So this blood, you know, coming back through the superior vena cava and back through the inferior vena cava is deoxygenated blood, right? Because it just got delivered out to the body. The body took up and used all of that oxygen, right? So now the blood that's coming back from the body is deoxygenated because the body used it all up. And that, uh, oops, that blood is high with carbon dioxide, right? Because as the body uses oxygen, it makes that carbon dioxide as a byproduct, right? So the whole reason why we breathe out carbon dioxide, is it's, it's a waste product of the fact that our body used the oxygen, right? Uses the oxygen, makes the carbon dioxide as a waste, right? So this blood coming back to the heart is high on carbon dioxide and low on oxygen, 
right, I'm just getting into our terminology. Right? It's hypoxia, hypoxia, low oxygen. Uh, less commonly talked about is hypercarbia, right? Carbia, like carbon dioxide. Right? So hypercarbia would be high carbon dioxide. Um, again, as I do a lot of anatomy and physiology review, I like to pull in a lot of medical terminology because it just gets more terms out there for us, builds that uh, comfortability with it, and builds that uh, confidence as you start to see these types of words. So this hypoxic blood and hypercarbic blood comes into the right atrium, and the right atrium sends that blood down to the right ventricles through the tricuspid valve. Right? Tricuspid valve, right? Tricuspid valve, tri is three, so it's three flaps, right? So three valve flaps uh, that allow that blood to move from the atria down to the ventricles. So tricuspid valve there between the right atrium and the right ventricle, that one's called the tricuspid valve. Then the right ventricle, when it contracts, it pumps that blood out through another valve, right? And that valve, is our pulmonic valve. Okay. Pulmonic valve, meaning it's going to the pulmonary system or it's going to the lungs. Right? So out, uh, out that right ventricle, right? blood flow goes over to the right lung and blood also goes out to the left lung and those are our pulmonary arteries, pulmonary arteries, right? Arteries take blood away from the heart, right? So these arteries that are branching off of the right ventricle take blood to the lungs, away from the heart. So they're going to the lungs, away from the heart, so they're pulmonary arteries. Uh, these are still carrying the same low oxygen, high carbon dioxide uh, blood that our body received uh, into that right side of the heart, into the right atrium and the right ventricle. So now we're just sending it out to the lungs and that branches down the smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller uh, pulmonary arteries until we get to that alveoli level. Right? So alveoli is where we're actually getting that gas exchange happening inside the body. Right? So this is where we're sending uh, the air that we're breathing in and out, good. and then running right alongside those alveoli are now the smaller and smaller blood vessels or pulmonary capillaries. Right? And that capillary bed are those teeny tiny little blood vessels that actually allow for the gas exchange to occur. So this blood that's coming down here is low oxygen, high carbon dioxide, right? and compared to the air that we're breathing into our body, the air that we're breathing is high on oxygen and low on carbon dioxide, the air we're breathing in. Right? So at this alveolar capillary level, the oxygen is going to diffuse from high to low, and the carbon dioxide is going to diffuse from high to low. Right? So the high concentrated oxygen air that we're breathing in is gonna diffuse into the bloodstream because there's less oxygen there. And that bloodstream that has more carbon dioxide than the air that we're breathing into our body is gonna diffuse into the alveoli and then we breathe that carbon dioxide out. Um, so it's big on, it's just diffusion, right? It's gas exchange. Uh, when we get into some of the disorder and disease processes and we talk about like a CHF patient, where one of the signs and symptoms that they have is pulmonary edema or fluid. Edema is fluid. Pulmonary is lungs. So pulmonary edema is fluid building up in the lungs. Uh, if you have a lot of fluid in here, gas does not dissolve well through fluid, right? So oxygen can't get well into the bloodstream. Carbon dioxide isn't getting well out of the bloodstream. Uh, so we start getting more hypoxic internally and we're getting more and more of a buildup of carbon dioxide inside the body because we're not able to eliminate it. So we're getting more of the waste products building up and less of the good stuff, less of the oxygen getting in. So now this blood 
that just got oxygenated, right? As it leaves the lungs, now it's high oxygen levels and low carbon dioxide levels. Uh, that blood comes back to the left atrium from each of the lungs, right? Through our pulmonary veins, right? The blood vessels going to the lungs, right? So generally speaking, throughout our body, we say arteries carry high oxygenated blood and veins carry deoxygenated blood. In the pulmonary system, you gotta flip flop it, it's backwards. So our pulmonary arteries are carrying deoxygenated blood and our pulmonary veins are carrying oxygenated blood. So you gotta remember that difference. So the pulmonary veins are bringing blood back into the left atrium, right? It goes from the left atrium down to the left ventricle through the bicuspid valve, right? Bicuspid valve, right? tricuspid, tri is three, bicuspid is two. So the bicuspid valve just has two flaps compared to the three flaps on the right side. The other name, right? bicuspid valve, also known as the mitral valve, right? So those get used interchangeably. You gotta know both because you may get a test question that references it as the bicuspid valve. And you gotta know which one that is. Another test question may reference it as the mitral valve, right? It's, it's allowed, right? And it's something that uh, our body obviously, or our, in medicine and in, in anatomy and physiology, we oftentimes have a, several names for different structures and different uh, functions. So bicuspid valve or the, mica, or the mitral valve is on the left side. And then when that left ventricle contracts, it sends blood out the aortic valve, which goes out to the aorta throughout our body to now deliver that highly concentrated of oxygen, oxygenated blood throughout the body for all of our tissues to utilize that oxygen that it needs. Right? So again, so much of that purpose and that function is delivery of oxygenated blood. Um, another aspect to think beyond just these structures, right? So this is where I would encourage you to either make an index card of each of the structures, the vena cava, right atrium, tricuspid valve, right ventricle, mix them all up and then put them in order, right? Be able to work yourself through exactly what are all the structures that a red blood cell would pass through on the way through this whole cardiovascular system because then if we say our patient is having left-sided heart failure, and we'll do CHF uh, in the next uh, session, if we do, uh, if we say they have left-sided heart failure where that left ventricle can't pump properly, well, instead of sending blood from the left ventricle out the aortic valve to the aorta in the body, if that left ventricle is failing, the blood is gonna back up from the left ventricle into the left atrium, okay? And then from the left atrium, through the pulmonary veins, back to the pulmonary capillaries, and that's where that pressure actually pushes that fluid into the alveoli, and you get pulmonary edema start showing up. All right, so just by saying, okay, this is what part of the heart is failing and not functioning properly, as you can figure that out to tell you what signs and symptoms you're going to have. Or if you start with the signs and symptoms, you can go the other direction and say, hey, based on these signs and symptoms, that is telling me they're having left-sided heart failure. Or they're having that left-sided CHF exacerbation, that heart failure, congestive heart failure. So good. Uh, a couple of other notes. Uh, the generic names, right? We have atrioventricular valves. Right? Atrioventricular valves or AV valves. That's the generic name for the valves between the atria, right? So our tricuspid valve and the bicuspid or mitral valve, those are our AV valves, right? They're between the atria and the ventricles. Uh, the other generic name for the other two are called semilunar valves. That's this aortic valve and pulmonic valve. Semilunar, right? Semi is lunar. It just means half moon shaped, right? half moon shaped right? uh, versus the tricuspid and the bicuspid valve have slightly different shaped, uh, have slightly different shaped um, flaps or valves there. Cool. 
so that is uh, really some of those other structures. Uh, the other part that uh, I want to reference and hit on is that right ventricle. Right? The right ventricle is weaker than the left ventricle. Because right? the right ventricle just has to pump with enough force to get to the lungs and back. That's it. Right? Uh, the left ventricle, though, has to pump with enough force to get the blood all the way out to our fingers and toes and all the way up to the top of our head. Right? So uh, very much a, a difference in uh, structure there, a difference in uh, functioning, a difference in strength. Right? So that left side is a much stronger muscle. Right? It can pump that blood throughout the entire body. Right? The right ventricle is much weaker muscle. It just has to pump blood to the lungs and back. Right, so it's a much more demand is on that left side of the heart compared to the right side of the heart. Cool. So that's really, I mean, that's a, a lot of just A and P structure stuff to just jump right into today. Um, but it's a very good uh, review of a lot of that type of stuff. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, and uh, we can use this to kind of springboard us into some other uh, disease processes and other things that are going on. And we can use that to review and, and cover more things. Uh, so that's a good kind of stopping point for this uh, section today on it. And like I said, I hope that was beneficial and we will post it. So if you missed it, you'll be able to uh, watch it and review it later. Uh, and certainly all the National Registry stuff as well. Um, more of these days, an hour just goes by so fast. Uh, I won't spend all that time talking about National Registry every time unless it really just comes up and it's been a little while and we need to review it again. Uh, so we'll open up more time. We'll do even more uh, test prep questions to really walk through how to evaluate those questions and more anatomy and physiology review uh, and really that signs and symptoms, that pattern recognition that I was talking about. So thank you very much. And I hope that this uh, was helpful and I look forward to doing it uh, at least weekly, maybe even more often. So keep an eye out for uh, some emails from me, some messages, and I'll just keep doing more and more and more of these. So thank you very much and I will see you later. Bye.